chapter 2 of 1 Thessalonians. Paul begins his letter by reminding them that previously he and Silas had, had suffered, had been persecuted in Philippi. And even though they had been falsely imprisoned, even though they had been beaten, even though they had been driven from the city, they still had the audacity to come to Thessalonica and to declare the good news and the hope of Jesus to them in the face of strong opposition. 1 Thessalonians is a letter. It is what I find to be probably one of Paul's most encouraging and positive letters. Some of his letters he seems to be dealing with some very, very serious and challenging complexities within the church. We don't get that sense of 1 Thessalonians. He's encouraging them. He loves these people. It's a letter that began because Paul and Silas had come to the city of Thessalonica. And we don't know exactly how long they were in the city. He mentions that he had gone to the synagogue at least three times. That would mean at least three weeks. Though he also speaks of working amongst them. He speaks of people hearing about their faith and it being spread throughout. Most people, what I can see, generally assume Paul and Silas lived in Thessalonica for roughly six months. We don't actually know when it doesn't have any bearing upon the story, but they, he was there for a long enough period of time to establish a church, but yet not long enough for him to feel like they had a fully formed foundation. As happened so often, persecution came and they were forced to flee the city again. And they're left to wonder, did the church know enough? Are they, are they going to survive? Are they going to be able to thrive in the midst of the persecution? Even though they left, the agitators remained. And they worried and they wondered. And they, they wanted to come back to Thessalonica. They wanted to find out. But they were blocked. He says they were blocked by Satan. Finally, they decide to send Timothy to them. And so they send Timothy to the city of Thessalonica. Timothy comes, finds a church not only that's surviving, but a church that's thriving. But they seem to also have some questions and aspects that they wonder. That they, there's still gaps in, in, in quite, that they have within their own learning and knowledge. And so they, when Timothy returns back to Paul and Silas, we believe they were in Corinth at the time, the three of them craft a letter that is then sent back to the church in Thessalonica. And it seems to be trying to address and to answer the questions and the wonderings that they have. I think ultimately the reason for this letter is the reason why I've, though I don't really put it on anything, the reason why I called this sermon series, May the Lord. And I think that the ultimate purpose of Paul's letter, it's found in, in chapter 3, verses 12 and 13, which is partly on the screen, as well as in chapter 5. He writes to encourage them. He writes to them to say, May the Lord make your love increase and overflow for each other and for everyone else just as ours does for you. May he strengthen your hearts so that you will be blameless and holy in the presence of our God and Father when our Lord Jesus comes with his holy ones. And then in chapter 5, verse 23, he says, May God himself, the God of peace, sanctify you through and through. May your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. The one who calls you is faithful and will do it. Ultimately, he writes to them, I think, to say to them, may God make your love increase. And may God himself sanctify you and keep you holy. This is the purpose of why he writes. This is the purpose of his letter. Last week, I laid a groundwork as far as kind of the background of Thessalonica and the background of 1 Thessalonians. And I'm not going to rehash through all of that more than I already have. But I also ask you to read the five chapters of 1 Thessalonians. Because I think what Paul teaches and demonstrates in his letter is about how to live in a hostile environment, how to live in challenging and certain times. He speaks not only of the, his experience of how they lived amongst them, but also he speaks to them about how they should live now as a church. And he answers that question. And ask you to, to read through 1 Thessalonians and the five chapters and to ask this question, what does he teach us? What did he demonstrate for us about how to live 
in these challenging and certain times and to come back with one or two or three, but please not a 46 page document, as far as what um, you saw in that. So we're gonna see how this goes. I've got my trusty whiteboard here. So what did you see as you looked at First Thessalonians? He said, stay alert and clear-headed. Oh, that's good. We're good. <laughs> I was just trying to keep anxiety down. I'm not. <laughs> what anybody else see? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Anybody else? All right, Sylvia. Give me another one. To encourage. Yeah, and that's part of a series that he gives. He says he lived amongst them as a father, and that he encouraged, comforted, and urged. Encouraged them, comforted them, and shoved them. I'm going to ask you, where'd you see that? I'm not going to, man, I'm not going to like, argue with it, but all right. Oh, there we go. <laughs> mm -hmm. Right. Their faithfulness, as well as I think on the other side, we see Paul's faithfulness. I'll get into it a little bit more, but this, this aspect that they, he continued to declare the good news. He was faithful to his calling in the face of the opposition as well. Mm. It's kind of related to this one, yeah, that he says the live or lead, you said a quiet, that's not how you spell quiet, a quit life, quiet life. <laughs> wow, that's a new way to spell life too. It's a double I. All right. 
Very good. Very good. See, it's in there. Don't seek revenge. I think there's a whole kind of a segment there, but a little beyond what, what Sylvia had said. He talks about rejoice. All, it's kind of his, his you, can say, uh, you get the sense sometimes with Paul's letters that realize he, he's writing on a, on a papyrus. And sometimes you feel like he's, he's getting to the end. In fact, there, there are old historical documents, not necessarily scriptural ones, but where you see um, because they run out of space, that they then, they then kind of turn and go up the side. Uh, there's even some, which is incredible to see, where they actually, they, they write this way, turn it 45 degrees, or is it 90 degrees? 90 degrees. And then they write the other way, across it. So you, to read it, you, because, to save, because of shortage of paper, so you save here, you read, and then you have to turn and read. Um, that was a comment. So you, sometimes you get the sense when that's a long way of saying it. The answer. Sometimes Paul's just kind of like, I got to throw everything in there. I'm running out of space. So he just summarizes: Rejoice always, pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances. Do not quench the spirit. Do not treat prophecy with contempt. Test them all. Hold on to what is good. Reject every kind of evil. And he just kind of these bullet points. He tends to throw in there, and you kind of feel like he's trying to summarize everything about how to live. Live pure lives, yes. The church is not totally without challenges, and that is one area where we see in First Thessalonians, Paul is addressing um, some concerns. Anybody else? Mm -hmm. Live with expectancy. The return of Christ. Mm hmm. We've done really well, and um, there are, I'm sure, more, and you're welcome to find more. Look at that. As many of you know, and you've heard me tell way, probably way too many stories about it, but we'll tell some more. Um, years ago, I worked for a while at Hewlett Packard in Boise, Idaho, and they used to have, uh, in those days, excess equipment. And excess equipment, is, they would have um, literally thousands of pieces of printers, of computers, of, of networking hardware, all the different resources you would imagine at a massive tech site. Some of it was equipment that just wasn't needed anymore. Some of it was stuff that was used for research and development, and some of it didn't even exist on the market. It was just test products. Some of it were things where they were testing the paper feed, and so they ran 200,000 pieces of paper through it, and then what do we do with it? Um, all kinds of equipment. And for the most part, the only thing they knew what to do with all this equipment was to just, they would take it out on a pallet on a forklift, They'd go out over a dumpster and they'd raise the forklift as high as they possibly could get it, and then they'd shake it. So it would fall down into the dumpster and be broken so nobody could seal it or use it. And, and that's what, but they decided that not to do that with everything that they had, and so they allowed employees to take home excess equipment. And might as well give them the benefit. And so I had co-workers that had in their homes ten and $20,000 laser printers. Because... They could. Nobody needs a laser printer like that, but they had it. And if you imagine, if you will, and play with me on the story here, that 
If I was to go there and I was to decide to check out a $10,000 laser printer, I go to the loading dock, got all my paperwork signed, and I, they load it in the back of my truck, and as I'm driving out of the gate, and they, they realize it's rather rusty, and they're thinking nobody with a truck that looks like that has need of a printer that's worth that much. And so it gets swarmed by the Boise police, who does not understand how it is that this person just straight out of college needs a $20,000 printer that not only copies and, and prints, as you would expect, it also folds its staples, and incredibly, it will fold and stuff and seal envelopes for you and print the address on it. Yes, one of my coworkers actually had a printer that did that in his home because he could. And so as I'm trying to explain to them that I'm not committing grand theft and stealing this, I just want to put this in my little apartment, and as they're trying to shove me in the patrol car, who is it that I want to call at that moment? I want to call my boss, exactly. I want to call the guy at the loading dock. Who do I not want to call? Well, I don't really want to call Jay. Jay is a great guy. He was my mentor pastor, knows me really, really well at the time. Could be a great character reference. But I don't want to call him. Because as much as he may sit on the phone and try to explain to them that he's not really the kind of person to steal something like that, it doesn't do me any good. What I want to do is I want to call the guy who's intimately involved in the decision and the process to say, no, really, it's strange as it looks. It really is allowed. When Paul writes 1 Thessalonians, we get the sense as Timothy comes back to him that there, he is facing accusations. People are accusing he and Silas during their time there that they were manipulating, that they took advantage of them. They only came for a short time to get what they could out of them and left town. You get a sense that they're being accused of being a failure, that they abandoned this church, they abandoned them to the persecution, that they were false apostles. When Paul writes back to them, he doesn't send a letter to the, people, to the apostles in Jerusalem. He doesn't send a letter saying, could you guys give me a character reference? Could you like say you know, I'm, I'm, that I'm an apostle to the Gentiles? Could you tell them about my past and what kind of person I am and that I come to you under the authority of, of the, the church? And He doesn't look for a character reference. As great as that might be and as wonderful as it might be to have a reference of all the other disciples and the early leaders, what does he do? He writes to them and say, you are my character reference. You are the ones who know that I lived amongst you. You are the ones who, who are, are my letter. You know, he says, you know how we lived amongst you. In, in chapter 1, uh, verses 5 and 6, he says, not only do you know how we lived amongst you, he says, you became imitators of us. To use my silly illustration, that's me calling up my boss and saying, I know you think this is crazy, but you've got one sitting in your house too. You're doing it too, so don't yell at me. Basically what he says to them is, you not only know how we lived amongst you, but you copied us. And you lived like us. You are our evidence and if I'm a, a false apostle, if I'm a person who lied and deceived and manipulated you, so are you. Because you live like us. You are the evidence. You are the faithfulness. Your response to the gospel. You heard us preach. You heard the message and the good news that we shared, he says, but you didn't just hear it as our words. You didn't just hear it as Paul, you're just an amazing motivational speaker. He says, you heard it as the very voice of God. and You changed your lives. And not only that, but that story of your faithfulness, he says, it went out to the other churches in the region. People heard about you. They heard about your response. They heard about your faithfulness in the face of opposition. You are the evidence of our mission. He says, we lived as people seeking to please God, not looking for praise from people. How do we live in the midst of challenging and uncertain times? He says, we live as people seeking to please God, not looking for praise from people. In Matthew chapter 10 and Luke chapter 10, Jesus is sending out his disciples. 
And he says to them, when they come to a community, when they come into a, into a city to look for a person of peace. A person of peace is that bridge person. It's that person that not only connects and understands the church, but they also connect to the culture and the community. And they function as your bridge between. For Paul coming to Thessalonica, you can imagine that Jason, whose house church they're in, was that bridge person. He was that person of peace. He was a, a resident of Thessalonica, but he responded to the gospel, and he opened his home as a place. He says, but when you come into that community and you find that person of peace, then, then live there and amongst and, and share the good news. But he also says something else. You may come into a community, and there is nobody there. There is no person of peace. There is nobody who wants to hear what you have to say. There was nobody to be a bridge to you. And what does he say to do? Shake the dust off your feet and move on. Not everyone is going to like what you have to say. Not everyone is going to welcome you, but go anyway. Live as people seeking to please God, not to please people, because not everyone is going to like it. Resist the temptation to use flattery. He says, we did not use flattery. We did not put on masks to cover up greed. Resist the temptation to try to make people like you. Paul could say that because he knew that his motives were pure. I was thinking about, as I, and I wrote down on my notes as I studied this and was thinking about this, and I said, well, what, what are impure motives? What are impure motives that I even that I feel sometimes? But how one lives amongst in a community. And I think even as we think about dinner at church or the launching of, of, of new Christian communities and, and interacting in our community, this question of what are the impure motives that we can be so tempted to draw and on the surface may not always look bad. I wrote down four. One motive is to grow a church. We do it so that there's more people in the seat for bigger numbers. We do it to make a name for ourselves. It's always nice to be in that article, you know, in the denomination magazine saying, here's somebody doing something. We do it to save the church. We do it to be an influencer. We want to have influence in the community. We want to be a place that somebody looks to. Our motive, he says, is to please God. And it is God who looks at our heart. Proverbs chapter 16 says, All a person's ways seem pure to them, but motives are weighed by the Lord. We are all tempted in our motives, and we can justify and explain, I'm really good at it. But Paul reminds us that all of our motives are weighed by God. Our motive and desire is to love God, to love our neighbor. And so he says, not only do we live amongst you, not only do we share the good news with you, but he says we shared our lives with you. They shared not only their message, but they shared their lives. They were not satisfied with simply performing the duties of Christian ministry. Not simply satisfied with carrying out the task, but they lived amongst them. They opened up their lives. They were prepared to share the deepest level of their lives with them. You don't share your life with a project. And it's easy to look at people. It's easy to look at a community and to see them as a project. As somebody to achieve a goal. As somebody who can fill a seat. As somebody who can save you. or You can get them on a task. To not instead to love. So when you share your life with somebody rather than simply being a project, when you love somebody, you love them as important as it is 
as much as we believe that Jesus is the only way, as much as we believe that he is the truth and the life, and we believe this is about life and death. But when you love them not as a person, not as a project, you love them even if they never, ever respond. Even if they never come to faith. Because they're a person, they're not a project. They're not somebody that's simply a goal to an end, to be a statistic on a chart. We love, we welcome. We share not only the good news with you. This wasn't about simply starting a church. He said we shared our lives. You are the evidence of the kind of people that we are. You are our evidence, he says. How do we live in challenging and uncertain times? Two of the ways that I would say is we live by seeking to please God and not people. Not looking for praise from people, but seeking to live as people of the kingdom. And we share the good, not only the good news, but we share our lives with others. For they are people and not projects. We open our hearts and their lives to them. Let's pray together. We love God because you first loved us. We share and we live our lives because you first gave your life. Jesus, you came. You, you not simply lived amongst us. Not, you didn't simply come and say, I am God. But you lived. You shared your life. You laughed. You cried. You suffered. You walked. You were thirsty. You were hungry. You were tired. And you declared the kingdom of God has come. And you continued the call. And you continued to say, come, follow me, even to some who never would respond. And it is our desire to love you and to love our neighbor. To live as you have lived. To be used by you. We pray for your spirit to come. To renew to transform, to restore. For you are good and you are great. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.